So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to presenting our next speaker. And many of you know he has been at the forefront, forefront of megalithic research around the world. His classic book from the Ashes of Angels, and more recently his Gebekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods book, is set to become an instant classic in this field. He's been at the forefront of the questing movement for many years. He founded the Questing Conference, and he really is a living legend. So please give a big warm welcome to Andrew Collins. Well done. Hello, hello. Right. Lost World of the Human Hybrids is the name of the lecture. You'll see why. Uh, my book, Gebekli Tepe, which came out earlier this year, suggested that the comet impact, which science now knows took place around 10,900 BC, created a uh, global ash cloud due to wildfires, which went up into the atmosphere and blotted out the sun, causing a nuclear winter for an extended period of time. This and other things triggered a 1,300-year mini ice age known as the Younger Dryas. Um, and basically, it would appear that this caused both the cataclysm itself and the actual um, re-advance of the ice sheets caused a number of different cultures and populations around the world to migrate into ter new territories um, most obviously going towards the south, because this wasn't just a period of, um, you know, the temperature drop by at least 10 degrees, but on top of this was the fact that there were severe droughts, because the, um, the ice takes up all the water and causes, you know, massive famines and droughts. So you can imagine all these people, you know, being displaced into, you know, neighbouring territories, uh, coming across the inhabitants of these, these territories, perhaps bashing them on the head or trying to take over and whatever. Well, amongst these people in Central and Eastern Europe were a population known as the Swiderians, after a place called Swidery in Poland. Now, their territories stretched all the way from the Carpathian Mountains in the west right way across to some of the large rivers in central Russia. Um, and as I show in Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, there is good evidence to suggest that the Swiderians migrated south and entered into the area of the Caucasus, and from the Caucasus went through the Armenian highlands into the area of southeast Anatolia, um, where Gebekli Tepe was constructed around 11,500 years ago. Now, the Swiderians, this is the image that was done for uh, the book by the London artist um, Russell Hussein, who's, no, who's not with us today but will be on the walk tomorrow. Um, the Swiderians were reindeer hunters, they were wolf shaman, uh, they were long distance traders in exotic flint and obsidian. Um, they're also some of the earliest open-cast miners um, in the world. Plus, they were stone tool specialists with a sophisticated stone-making technology. Um, and amongst the technologies they introduced into uh, the area of southeast Anatolia was something known as advanced pressure flaking. Now, I'm not going to go into what that is, but it basically it makes flints look very, very beautiful, as you can see of these obsidian points here which actually come from central Anatolia. Um, and it would seem as if they introduced these ideas into um, the area of Anatolia from Russia and the Ukraine. Now, the incoming Swiderians would seem to have entered the communities not only as traders, but also as virtual messianic figures. And the reason for this is that it would appear that even a thousand years after the cataclysm, there were still other events going on bad things were going on in the world, and there was this constant fear of further cataclysm every time comets appeared in the sky. And it's my belief from the evidence that I've discovered is that they possibly came up with the remedy of how to counteract the supernatural forces that were uh, responsible for these cataclysms, which they saw in terms of a supernatural wolf or fox. 
um, and that one of the solutions was the supersizing of cult buildings and the creation of complexes like Gebekli Tepe, of which I think Gebekli Tepe is probably only one of various examples uh, around the world which are now being realized for their great antiquity. Moreover, moreover, there is evidence that the Squiderians were Neanderthal human hybrids. Um, and this, is, this comes from anatomical evidence that's been associated with their culture, which shows that they were uh, extremely long-headed uh, individuals they had, with strong brow ridges, uh, large jaws, and other so-called archaic human features. Um, and the first person to connect them with this was the famous Lithuanian um, archaeologist and prehistorian Marija Gumbatas, um, who was a very, very, very clever woman and written various books, as many of you will probably know. Now, the difference between ourselves and our distant cousins, the Neanderthals, um, is most obviously seen in the skulls. Because our Homo sapien um, uh, ancestors had skulls that were, 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 were actually a lot thinner, you know, longer. The, uh, the Neanderthal skulls were, were much wider. But the important thing is that the Neanderthals had much longer skulls. Um, they had what's known as a, an occipital bun here, which you can see here, okay? Um, and it would seem as if the hybrids inherited this, as, as we'll see. And this is very, very important. I mean, this is a skull from a place called the Shanadar Cave in, um, in uh, Upper Iraq. Um, and it dates about 60,000 years old. It's Neanderthal. And you can see just how extended this skull actually is. And there's a significance here in this particular skull because in 1982, a, um, uh, an anthropologist by the name of Trinkus uh, actually wrote a thesis suggesting that the skulls that were found in the, the Shanidar cave, of which there was more of them, um, actually were artificially deformed. In other words, you know, this, this was deliberate skull, skull elongation. And yet, years later, he and other writers retracted this and said, no, we got it wrong. These are actually natural skulls. And this is really, really interesting when you come on to the whole idea of whether elongated skulls are natural or not. Here's another skull from a place called um, Amud in Upper Galilee in Israel, which is 60,000 years old. Um, you can see the, the occipital bun there, how, how wide it is, against our own ancestors, which is Cro-Magnon man in Europe, is 28,000 years old. And you can see how rounded that is. And look at the forehead. The forehead goes straight up. The forehead on the Neanderthals sweeps back, and you can see these incredible brow ridges. These same brow ridges are found on the anatomical evidence related to the Swiderians. We don't have that. I mean, obviously, there's still people alive today that have these brow ridges, and there is a strong possibility and a strong case to suggest that you know, they have a, a bit more Neanderthal in them than, than, than other people. Now... It would appear that the Swiderians themselves had long heads and that their descendants um, in southeast Anatolia and in northern Syria and northern Iraq remembered these ancestors themselves and actually saw themselves as their um, descendants, you know, that the, they formed their own elites and continued the traditions and that they deliberately deformed their heads to look like the ancestors. In other words, they themselves now, although they actually had long heads, they were accentuating the size of it by deliberately deforming them. Almost, you know, caricaturizing their own belief in what the, the ancestors had. And this is a particular skull um, that dates about 5,500 to 4,500 um, from uh, the Halif culture who was definitely one of the direct descendants of the Gebekli builders. Um, and eventually, this idea of, of skull elongation was portrayed in um, statues. And these are the most obvious examples. Many of you will have seen these uh, in my books and others. The culture that followed the Halif was the Ubaid. 
Um, and these particular statues, which are both male and female and appear to have a serpent or lizard-like head, uh, were found in many, many graves and have been associated by prehistorians with the skull elongation of the Halif and the Ubaid people. So in other words, basically what this actually shows is some kind of abstract form of an elite who had existed with an elongated head. And coming forward from this, it would seem as if the memory of these people with the elongated heads eventually ends up becoming the creators of civilization in the myths and legends of the Sumerians, where they are known as the Anunnaki, um, or the Anuna, which is the, the, the root word behind it, which means something like gods of heaven or the heavenly ones. Although I think originally the term was nothing to do with the gods themselves, just simply meant the sky people. Uh, and they, they were said to have snake-like features. Um, and I think that this is, again, a memory of this elite, almost certainly the Swiderian peoples, peoples who came into southeast Anatolia, created places like Gebekli Tepe, founded the Neolithic Revolution, um, and are remembered in this mythical manner. But the Anuna people were recalled also in Hebrew myth um, as the tall, viper-faced or serpent-headed watchers of the Book of Enoch, um, who are definitely linked through various traditions with the area around Gebekli Tepe. Okay, and again, as I say, all of this is, is in the book. So were the watchers and the Anunnaki not aliens, as some believe, uh, but incoming elite groups from the north that included Neanderthal human hybrids. If so, then what was the origin of hybridization? Uh, where and when did it happen? What impact did it have on the rise of civilization? Well, obviously, you're probably all aware of the whole idea of out of Africa, and that's the fact that our earliest ancestors um, who they generally refer to as the, our common ancestor, came out of Africa at some point in the past um, and created the various different types of so-called hominid or hominin, including homo sapiens, basically, our own ancestors. And amongst them was the Neanderthal peoples. Um, and they came out of Africa any time between about 500 to about 200,000 years ago and populated... Europe, South West Asia, and as far east as Siberia. Um, and they hung around until around 30,000 years ago when our own ancestors definitely overrode their presence in Europe and, and Western and Central Asia, and they disappeared. Now, why exactly they disappeared, we don't know. I mean, we could have wiped them out, we could have interbred with them, you know, in other words, they eventually became us. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that hybridization took place. In other words, we had sex with the Neanderthals. We produced offspring, and those offspring exist. And it's a fact that between 1 and 5% of our DNA is actually Neanderthal. Virtually everybody who left Africa, including everybody in this room, have between 1% and 5% Neanderthal. So ultimately, we're all hybrids, really. But back in the past 20, 30,000 years ago and before, obviously that percentage was much, much higher. And in fact, only within the past few weeks, um, the genome of an um, early modern human um, was um, sequenced um, from a, a person that lived in the Ural Mountains of eastern Russia, um, and it, the evidence that this presented suggested that the hybridization began around 50,000 years ago and may have only taken place for a few thousand years. In other words, it didn't uh, happen all the way through until 30,000 years ago, that it may have all have happened quite quickly. And if the Swiderians were hybrids, how did they become hybrids, basically? Now, the, the Swiderians emerged from an East European population known as the Gravatians. 
um, who thrived essentially between about 40 and 17,000 years ago. Now, there are key Gravatian sites in central Russia that existed during this time. Um, and the main ones are a place called Sungar near uh, Moscow and a place called Kostenki on the Don River. Uh, and these, these sites are shown here, Sungar and Kostenki. I mean, Kostenki itself is made up of, of, I don't know, almost, I think, 20 different sites, all focused around the, the Don River. Uh, and Sungar itself seems to be a, an individual place. But when you start looking at these cultures, they were quite incredible in what they achieved. I mean, for instance, at Sungar, um, the evidence of the, of the fossil remains that they found were covered in thousands and thousands of ivory beads, um, which had obviously formed part of some kind of, of, of tailored dress, which has been reconstructed here by a Czechoslovakian artist by the name of Libor Balak, um, who's really brought alive the, um, the, you know, the, 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 this particular Gravatian uh, culture, these people, and what they look like. And you know, this, is, this is what he feels that they did. And they lived in houses which looked like something that you know, could have been constructed in the last 50 years. I mean, again, here's the examples here. Look at this. You know, and, and the sophistication of the clothing that they were wearing is, is something which is beyond that which we would even try and achieve today. And at Kostenki, on the Don River, there's evidence of, of um, agriculture going back 30,000 years. I mean, that's, that's nearly 20,000 years earlier than that which occurred in the Middle East at the time of the Neolithic Revolution. In other words, they, they were domesticating plants this early. That shows how advanced these people were. And only in the last week, the genome of a skull from Kostenki, dating back uh, 36,000 years, has revealed some in quite incredible information. Um, because you can see here, it's known as Kostenki 14, and you can see these brow ridges here, which again is like the Swiderian peoples have. This shows this connection with the Neanderthals, but it says, and this is just the abstract, um, I've yet to actually read the actual um, science report, but it says, we find that Kostenki 14 contains more Neanderthal DNA than is contained in longer track present in Europeans. In other words, these truly were hybrids. There's no question about that, both in appearance and in their DNA. And here's the skull here. As you can see, very, very distinct. But what's also interesting is that the very earliest layers at Kostenki, something very strange is going on, because it's quite obvious that there's a presence of Neanderthals there. Um, their particular style of, of um, tools are known as Mysterian, which you can see mentioned here. Um, and yet, at the same time, these are overlaid by these incredibly sophisticated stone tools suddenly start appearing, almost as if there are two separate communities right at the beginning of Kostenki, almost as if you've got maybe the humans and you've also got the Neanderthals, and something's going on to suddenly create this incredible sophistication. Is it hybridization? Is something going on in these people's minds? Um, they're also producing incredible, um, not just uh, tools, but also uh, things like bone needles and that, which shows that they also were using um, tailored clothing at this time. And. Um, so if something's going on, it says it, it was as if one culture was advanced in terms of bone and ivory tool making and a decorative figurative art, while the other produced little more than crude stone tools. Now, that seemingly is the Neanderthals, but clearly the humans are producing this, or we can only assume that they're humans, and we'll come on to whether they were or not in a minute. But something's going on, and I think the answer is hybridization. In other words, there were Neanderthals here, the humans come in, they mate with them, and something weird goes on in the minds of the descendants who have now got this admixture of two different types of DNA. Now, the Gravatians were in, as I said, the area of central uh, Russia, but it would seem as if they moved 
west fairly quickly into the area of the Middle Danube. Um, and there are a number of sites on the Middle Danube producing the most incredible material from about 30,000 years to about 20,000 years ago. Um, and this is interesting because once again we've got evidence of these human hybrids because a place called Brun, um, which was in Moravia in 1891, it's now part of the Czech Republic, um, they've discovered these, this um, fossil evidence of, of humans which was so different to the Cro-Magnons of, of Europe that they called them, you know, after the place that they were discovered, which was this place called Brun. And what happened then is that you had something called Brun man existing. So you had Cro-Magnon man in the west, and in the east you had this Brun man. And for a while, a number of the books on anthropology talked about this Brun race or Brun man or whatever, because the fact that they were so distinctive with this, this, this eye, you know, the heavy brow ridges um, and the long jaws and, you know, the, the really heavy, thick set, almost archaic features of them which were so different to the Cro-Magnons at the time. Here's Cro-Magnon again. You can see that the very rounded nature of the skull here. Um, and this is from another site that produced Brun Man evidence, a place called Predmosi, um, which is also in uh, Moravia, the Czech Republic, as it is today. And you can see how long the occipital bum is of that, how different it is. This is a hybrid, there's no question about this. And these are the ancestors of the Swiderian peoples. This is a little statue, it's not very big, made of ivory that was found at one of these uh, Gravatian sites in the Middle Danube, a place called uh, Dolny uh, Vestanici. Um, and this is very remarkable. And certain books on anthropology actually even suggest this is what Brun Man looked like. And look how long these faces are. And compare this against the image that um, the late Billy Walker John did for my book, from the ashes of angels of a watcher going from the description as given in the book of Enoch um, and putting a feather coat on it not just because of what the book the book of Enoch says but also because vulture shamanism seemed to have been a very important uh, part of the early Neolithic um, in the Middle East um, and then if we put that against Russell Hussein's recreation 3D sculpt of Billy Walker John's image, which he did off his own back, which is how he, he first made himself known to me. Look how similar that is to this image, supposedly of Brun Man, from Czechoslovakia. I mean, I just think it's re so remarkable that simply from the description of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch, that we came to exactly the same, um, f you know, sort of uh, anatomical um, appearance of this Brun man, which we might as well just call a hybrid, basically. And I'm dead certain that that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with Neanderthal human hybrids. And of course, this idea is not new. Um, there was a writer by the name of Stan Goosh who did a number of books from the 1970s through to uh, his death in, in 2010. Um, some of them are available now, and if they're not on your bookshop, shame on you, they should be on there, because these are incredible books. And basically what they do is show that civilization and the advancement of the mind was all the way down, was, put, was basically down to hybridization. And he believed that the Neanderthals were dreamers, creators, artists, uh, hippies, pagans, perfectionists, pacifists, troglodytes, nocturne, left-handed, red-haired matriarchs, whereas he saw the anatomical modern humans as rationalists, attackers, dominators, right-handed, uh, black or fair-haired patriarchs. But, and obviously I've used these examples here as the, as the um, Neanderthal, and obviously this is one of our own ancestors, but that the bringing together of these two different types of human created something absolutely unique. Something that was driven by different motivations to either of the original types of hominin, either the Neanderthals or the Homo 
uh, Sapiens himself. And the other interesting thing that was pointed out by Stan Goosh is that it would appear that the large occipital bun of the Neanderthals was there to house a much bigger area of the brain known as the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum competes, is, is all to do with dreams, um, creativity, um, you know, what we would call the paranormal, if you like, the, the, the mystery of everything. Whereas the, the, the cerebrum is associated with all the functional aspects of human life. And although we, we humans have both of them, it would seem that in the Neanderthals, they were much bigger. And he believed that the actual long head that they had was to actually house the much bigger cerebellum. In other words, these people were much more in touch with what we call the paranormal, uh, or the mysteries, the dreams, you know, the perfection. In other words, all that their lifestyle seemed to revolve around like an inner world as opposed to an outer world, which was that of our, of, of our own ancestor, our own human homo sapien ancestors. But what's interesting, and Stan Goosh points this out, is that it was Emanuel Swedenborg, um, this late 17th, early 18th century philosopher and free thinker and visionary, who first actually suggested the cerebellum was the seat of heaven and the place that angels contact us, which I find really, really, really fascinating. And I would like to look more into this. Um, in other words, you know, the cere cerebellum is, is a very important in communications with the other world. It's it, what the shamans would use to enter into altered states and achieve this communication with supernatural forces. And it was much more developed within the Neanderthals and not within us. But of course, once the two came together, then suddenly we had all these new ideas going on. You know, these hybrids were, were thinking completely differently, thinking completely new. I mean, for instance, it's been suggested that at Sungar, um, the Gravatian site uh, near Moscow, well, these people were the first astronomers. There's some evidence of this. But I found absolute evidence of it at Kostenki. Um, there was, at one of the Kostenki sites, a longhouse found. Um, and this longhouse seems to have been made of mammoth bones and all the rest of it. And down the middle of it was specifically nine fire pits. And I remember looking at this and thinking, that's got to be significant in some way, particularly when I found out that there are at least two other longhouses of a similar nature, other Kostenki sites, that also have nine specific uh, fire pits going down the river, oh, sorry, the riddle, river, down the middle of them. And anyway, I looked at these from, a, from a, an archaeo astronomical point of view, and I'm pretty certain they are directed exactly towards the moonrise at the time of, the, of the, its most northerly rising in the so-called lunar standstill cycle. And that's really interesting because that lunar standstill cycle is just over 18 years in length. And for nine years, quite specifically, the moon rises further north than the sun. In other words, it would seem to have more power than the sun itself. And then for the other nine years, it rises below the position on the horizon, i.e. below further south than the sun. And I think this is really, really significant discovery because it may well be that this is the earliest lunar temple anywhere in the world. And what's interesting is that within pits in this long house, we discovered a large number of Venus statues. And this Venus statue would seem to have been part of a cult, which I would associate with the power and effect of the moon, associate with female post potency, menses, creation, and life itself. And all of this is going on 30 to 40,000 years ago. So, was the Gravatian strange fascination with the moon inherited from the Neanderthals? The numbers 9 and 13, both numbers associated with the moon, are found in connection with, sequence, um, with sequences in Neanderthal graves in Europe. So, in other words, is it possible that these ideas 
were actually inherited by the hybrids from the Neanderthals themselves. Did this interaction between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans give us a different mindset, one embracing new ideologies? Did the combination of minds provide the seeds of civilization? Did it give us this, Gebekli Tepe? Is this the reason why Gebekli Tepe rose up 11,500 years ago? Is this the reason why the Gebekli builders, the Swiderians, the Watchers, the Anunnaki, whatever you want to call them, the Sky people, were able to convince these local people to supersize their cult buildings, their religious structures, to try and counter these supernatural forces in the sky that were producing, or they saw as producing, these cataclysms because they had this extra knowledge, this entirely different mindset because they were human hybrids? Well, I think the answer is yes, absolutely. So the Swiderians were descendants of the Gravatian populations. They were Neanderthal human hybrids. The origins of the Watchers and the Anarchy, um, the Sky People, that's who they were, I'm sure of it. But if so, and if this is all real, which I'm pretty certain it is, who else did we breed with before the rise of civilization? And what impact did that have on the world? Okay, I want to take us now into eastern or central, I should say central Asia, uh, in the Altai Mountains of northern Siberia. There's a, um, an archaeological site there known as the Denisova Cave. Um, and this region has been occupied by uh, modern humans possibly for 125,000 years. Um, and it's certainly been inhabited by our most distant ancestors, perhaps by as much as 800,000 years. And in 2008, the archaeologists working on this site, who, by the way, they believed that Neanderthals um, had been here because they found uh, various stone tools and artifacts that they had connected with the, the Neanderthal people, came across a tiny piece of a pinky bone, a finger bone. Uh, which they la later realized was that of, of, of a girl. Um, and it was sent off to the Max Planck Institute at Leipzig in Germany. And the genome was sequenced. And they were able to do this because the Denisova cave for you know, 12 months of the year is essentially at one degree Celsius. In other words, freezing point. And that preserved across tens of thousands of years, any kind of fossil uh, human remains. So anyway, they took it there, um, and they were able to achieve the, the genome sequence from it, which was published in, t in 2010. And this tiny piece of a pinky bone was found to be from a completely new population, which is today known as the Denisovans, obviously after the cave where the bone was discovered. Now, okay, this is, this is the bits which I've been trying to rehearse in my own head for, for, for weeks to try and get all this right. Because there are certain conundrums about who we are and where we come from and who our ancestors are. But the conclusions drawn from the Denisovan genome in 2010 was that, we, obviously, we've got a common ancestor. It could be these this early hominids, uh, hominin known as Homo heidelbergensis, and that around 500 to 700,000 years ago, there was a split. Um, and the split went one way to create Homo sapiens, our own ancestors, and the split the other way, eventually, probably around 200,000 years ago, created the Denisovans and also the Neanderthal people, because there was a close relationship, seemingly, between the genomes of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, okay? Now, I'm not going to go into it in any more detail. That's enough to sit with for the moment. However, the mitochondrial DNA that was also sequenced from the same 
pinky bone. Bear in mind the mitochondrial DNA is essentially the bacteria that lives within our cells and that's the workers, if you like, which is different. It's inherited from our mothers. It's not like the nuclear DNA. The evidence from the mitochondrial DNA of the Denisovan genome suggested that we had a common ancestor and that we parted from the Denisovans around one million years ago and that we parted from the Neanderthals about five to seven hundred thousand years ago. In other words, the Denisovans split off much earlier from the common ancestor um, and then later we split from the Neanderthals because our genome is closer to that of the Neanderthals than it is of the Denisovans. Okay, there's reasons for telling you all this which I'll come on, on to. However, all of what you've just seen here was thrown into complete chaos in December last year when they sequenced a genome the oldest, from the oldest human ancestor from Spain at a place called Cima de los Juan, Juanos. I've probably got that wrong, but uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, and this was 400,000 years old and was believed to belong to the ancestor of a hominin that was supposed to be our common, all, common ancestor of all of us, known as the Homo heidelbergensis. Okay. The problem with this, as I will show next, is that it showed something completely different again. Because what it suggested now is that there was a common ancestor and that the Denisovans had split off again earlier, but that we split off with the Neanderthals later, and that the genome of this Homo heidelbergensis from this cave in Spain was closer to the Denisovans than it was to the Neanderthals, which had not been predicted by the, um, the genetic anthropologists working on this. They had not predicted that. They thought that the genome of the Heidelbergensis people was going to be closer to the Antarctic. It wasn't. But for us, this is crucial for what I'll come on to now. Because we don't really know exactly who our common ancestor was. It probably was, to a degree, Homo Heidelbergensis, or one form of it. It could have been another form of early, early hominin known as Homo erectus. Okay. But the crucial thing here is that in South Africa, it was revealed in 2007 that the bones of Homo heidelbergensis were regularly over seven feet tall. Okay? Um, and, you know, the story is there. You can read it. You can see, see the, the account there. And that's interesting because... Aside from the pinky bone found in the Denisova cave, in the same layer, layer 11, which I'll come on to, in the year 2000, they, they'd found another bow, um, a, uh, not bone, a tooth, um, which you can see here, which was said to be a giant tooth. This is in the Nat Geo TV documentary on the subject from a rather big individual. Okay? So that's, that's tooth one, but then in 2010, August 2010, a second molar was found, which was described as a very big molar, uh, dismissed initially as that of a cave bear based on its morphology and its size. And this second Denisovan tooth had a chewing surface twice that of a typical human molar. We are talking about the possibility that the Denisovans were giants. Well, that may be the case, but before going on to this, we need to explore another further mystery. And that's layer 11 at the Denisova cave. Because very strange things have been coming out of this particular layer, which, by the way, dates approximately between 48 and 30,000 years ago, including this dark green chloriterite bracelet from layer 11. 
Now look how beautiful this is, and there's a report that's been done on this, and the drilling techniques and the, the style of it is so sophisticated, and yet this could be, well, certainly 30 to 40,000 years old, possibly 40,000. And this is incredibly advanced. It was worn on an arm, and there would have been like a, um, like a, a hold form of it, probably hanging from it. They, they've tested the wear on it. They believe that this is so. And here it is. Here's some, ex um, some pictures of it. And here's some more pictures of it. Okay. Who made this bracelet? And I ask this because other weird things have been coming out from this very same layer. The earliest eyed bone needles found in, the, um, found in Siberia come from this layer as well. Um, I mean, this, this is just extraordinary. Plus, on top of this, evidence from exactly the same layer suggests that whoever was here could have been riding horses 50,000 years ago. Bearing in mind that it's considered that horse riding probably only dates back to the, the early Bronze Age, and you'll find almost no evidence of horse riding prior to this time. It began in uh, Kazakhstan, although there's probably evidence even from there that it's far older. Um, so, did the Denisovans do all this 40 to 50 years, thousand years ago? And I say this because the prehistorians attribute all of these things in layer 11 that have been discovered to our own human ancestors because their mindset cannot handle the fact that these other people, these Denisovans, which we don't know much about clearly, might have been more intelligent, more sophisticated than our own ancestors. When we've already seen that quite clearly the Neanderthals were almost certainly more sophisticated in mind, certainly, than our own ancestors. So suddenly you're presented with this third type of hominin or human species who are more intelligent than us. And were they giants as well on top of this? Okay, so to answer that question, we have to follow the migrational routes of the, of the Denisovans. Right, Siberia was the Denisovan boundary in the west. Okay, and that seems to be about as far as they got because we found no other evidence so far that they were in uh, Western uh, Asia or in Europe or whatever. But the greatest percentage of, di of, of Denisovan DNA has been found in modern populations in Southeast Asia, as we'll come on to. Yet it is found also in at least three Native American populations. Which brings us on to the subject of my esteemed colleague, uh, Hugh Newman, who has brought us to this point. Because, as we know, there are thousands of reports of giants being discovered around the world, most of those in North America. Uh, here's obviously just a few of the accounts here. We don't need to go into them anymore. Now, these are, for the most part, found in mounds. Mounds that belong to the so-called Adena period, which stretched from around 1000 BC to around 300 uh, BC. Um, and they would seem to have been the main mound building cultures. They, would, they were superseded by another culture known as the Hopewell. Well, myself and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Greg Little, um, investigated various cases of, um, of, of mound, uh, sorry, of, of giant skeletons being found in mounds all over the United States um, for a book which came out in June this year, which uh, Hughes already mentioned, called Path of Souls. And here are the conclusions in here. That the American giants were Denisovan hybrids, the elite of the Adena period, whose ancestors arrived on the American land mass via Beringia, Siberia, as early as 15,000 BC. 
They controlled the spread of knowledge regarding the journey of the soul in the afterlife, especially its route to the sky world using the Milky Way, the so-called path of souls with its twin portals in Orion and Cygnus. Now, also that the greatest percentage of giant skeletons have come from the Kanawha Valley of West Virginia. Thus, they might have been responsible for some of the earliest monuments in this region, of which there are lots, and they're very strange. Um, for instance, this is the Creole Mound in South uh, Charleston, West Virginia. And when this was opened, um, I think the Smithsonian was involved with this, they found a giant in the center you can see here, this is a modern reconstruction, with 10 other normal-sized skeletons around this. And the evidence that's coming out from the mounds seems to be quite clear that the giants were the elite. They were the controllers of these tribal communities. They were the ones that held the knowledge, the power, um, certainly during the, 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 um, the Adena period, but we must assume that this didn't just begin at the Adena period, that they were around you know, for many, many, many thousands of years beforehand. Now, what I'm going to show you next is the curator of the South Charleston Museum describing a giant that was found in another mound known as Great Smith Mound, just up the road from the one that you see here. Could you just say that again? They, they found a giant. Uh, when they when whereabouts? They went into the Great Smith Mound over in Dublin. Yeah. Right. When what, what? they excavated, when the Smithsonian Institute excavated it, they found a gentleman in that uh, enclosure that was seven foot eight and three quarter inches tall. Okay. He had a, a span from his head to the end of his shoulder that was 18 inches, so his shoulder span would have been 36 inches without his head. Really? Was there anything with him? Any grave goods? I beg your pardon? Any grave goods? Any objects with him? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Copper breast plates and that sort of thing. Okay. So, what she's saying is that a giant quite specifically referred to as seven feet um, three and three quarters of an inch in, in height was found in this mound and that he had an incredible um, uh, shoulder width as well. Now, what were these pe these giants doing in the Kanoa Valley? That's how you correctly pronounce it, apparently. Well, it would seem that their main focus of interest was something which is known as Kanoa Black Flint. Um, and this is an example of it here. It's a particularly prized form of exotic material that was used uh, by Native Americans, particularly during the Adena period, but also much, much earlier, as we will see. Uh, this one, for instance, dates to what's known as the Archaic period, could be any time between 8,000 and 1,000 BC. Um, this is what's known as a, a lancelate um, point um, from the early Archaic period, um, 8,000 to 5,000 BC. And this looks very much similar to what's known as the Clovis point, which was produced by the the Paleo-Indians known as the Clovis culture, just prior to the Archaic period. And also there's some similarities with Europe, but also with uh, Siberian cultures as well. Now, Kanoa black flint is extracted from one place in particular, not necessarily the only place, but the main central place where it was, it was found was somewhere known as Mount Carbon. Um, on the Kanawha River, which is there, you can see that. And the, here, you have around the whole top of the mountain, these incredible stone walls, um, which had these beehive-shaped towers around them. In fact, uh, you know, several thousand years ago, this place would have looked something like Machu Picchu, basically, in Peru. And I, that, I kid you not, that's what it would have looked like. Um, and here's one of the uh, early plans that was done by antiquarians and historical societies in the area, uh, showing the extent of the walls, uh, what was left of them when they were explored. And these walls seem to be made of huge stone blocks, five or six feet across, 
uh, and the walls themselves were up to 15 to 20 feet high and as much wide. And a lot of them had been destroyed by mining operations on the mountain um, over the last hundred years or so. Mo ironically, quite a lot of them quite recently. But um, myself and um, Greg Little on the left and his, his wife Laura, um, we decided to see if we could get to the top of Mount Carbon and see whether any of these, um, these stone walls or any of these structures still existed today. But what we didn't realize until we got there really was that we'd have to walk the entire mountain because the mining company that's currently leased the, um, the hole has actually bolted it closed. So nobody, in theory, but you'll see otherwise in a minute, can actually get up onto the mountain. We had to go there officially as bird watchers. We got permission as bird watchers, okay, to hear the greater, lesser spotted, whatever it was. And um, that's the official reason. So we were going bird watching, okay? Just remember that if you have to retell this story. So we actually. The, the day that we did this was on dawn, um, Wednesday, October the 8th, which was the, um, the blood moon eclipse, quite strangely and eerily. I mean, there was a lot of strange omens going on as well the night before that we got there. And here's us uh, getting ready to go up. We went with three local people, um, including a, a naturalist um, and a person from the, the local council, um, so that, you know, this was all done above board. Um, Greg wouldn't have it any other way because uh, of his own particular line of work. So anyway, we started to climb it quite early in the morning, as you can see here, the mist still shrouding the top of Mount Carbon. And this is the view halfway up. And about halfway up, we suddenly stopped by these, um, there were two particular trucks, four wheelers, that had somehow got on the mountain by crossing a river or something, and they were bear hunters. Now, I don't condone hunting in any way, shape, or form, but it's an interesting and funny story. And this particular guy, you know, said that they were, they were hunting bears that day, and apparently you can kill two bears legally in the state of West Virginia each year. Lovely, eh? Um, and this guy had killed one the previous year, and this was his picture that he brought out from the cab to show the dead bear. Lovely. Anyway, he goes off with his mates. They've got bloodhounds that seek out the, um, the, the, the bears. There's I've, I've reasons for telling you this. Um, and so they go off, and then finally they come back and say, we've got a bear uh, trapped up a tree. But they've just come down from where we're walking up towards. We're going up there now to, to get this bear. All right, okay, okay. So anyway, they go off. Half an hour later, they come back down. They say, oh, I got away. And I'm thinking, thank God for that. I don't want that type of bad karma um, on, on my head the day we go up to Mount Carmen. You know, the Carmen, particularly as we're trying to appease the spirits and everything up here. And then I suddenly think, oh my God, we're walking up in the same area where there's now one pissed off bear that's been sent up a tree by bloodhounds, which was exactly what happened. We get up into this. We're now walking through the undergrowth, and there's bear poo all around. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I mean, you know, this seriously was bear tracks, and we're looking for these, these walls and these, uh, these cairns and ruined towers and things like this. And I've got one eye on the undergrowth all the time, thinking, where's this bear going to appear? I mean, particularly if he's got... If it's, if it's a mother with young or something, and apparently they're black bears, and with some bears you can lie down and pretend you're dead and they'll leave you alone, but not the black bears, they'll tear you apart, apparently. Lovely. Anyway, so we were apparently rewarded with our journey because when we got there, eventually um, we discovered that some of the walls still exist, 15 to 20 feet high. Here's one picture. Um, here's the stone blocks, I say blocks up to four to five feet across, probably larger. And in the past, they actually found large pieces of black, um, canaway black flint within the walls for no apparent reason. Quite clearly there was some kind of ceremonial or ritual reason for putting the, the black flint within the walls itself. Um, and here's the other side of that wall here, you see how it slopes down. Um, and here's just one block 
from that, which uh, you can see how eroded that is. Now, as to the age of these stone walls, um, it's unknown. I mean, no work has been done on them. Uh, some people accept that they're, they're, they're probably from the Adena period, so you know, anything up to 1000 BC. But most reports do suggest that the structures up there date to the Archaic period. And uh, my personal belief is that they are extremely old. They may have been rebuilt here and there, but they probably go back to at least 8000 BC and arguably much earlier still. And I'll tell you for why. Now here's a block of, of Kanawha black flint here, which we, we came across on, on the trail. Um, and you can see here, here's a bit's broken off. And I actually discovered up there, I mean, people know that this is a Native American site. So there have been people up here looking for, you know, work tools and flint points and things like this. Um, but I was able to find various um, pieces of worked tool, which when I came to um, examine them, I realized something quite significant about them. Now, clearly, these are the sort of things that the collectors have left behind. But to me, these were most important because they resembled greatly what's known as pre-Clovis points, which date to anything between 12 and 14,000 BC. Um, I mean, here's some examples from something called the Ark Site in New York State. Now, I didn't, at that point, even realize that there was a possibility that these flints, that this mining operations, and possibly even the walls, could date back to this time. I mean, it was a suggestion, but there'd been no evidence of this. Um, so I looked into this, and I found out that, um, that uh, at a place called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, which dates to 12, 14,000, is that they've actually found Canaway flint artifacts, um, artifacts, I should say, at that particular level. Now, the, if these were related in some way to uh, Denisovans, which I think that they probably were for reasons which are in the book Path of Souls and to do with the reason why they've got double rows of teeth, which I haven't really got time to go into today. But what did these giants look like? What did these Denisovans look like? Um, because I think that what you're, you're looking at here, as far as the giants are concerned, are Denisovan hybrids. Now, whether they are Denisovan human hybrids or whether they are Denisovan Neanderthal hybrids or whatever, we don't know. But, but um, myself and um, my colleagues got um, Russell Hussein, the artist that did the Swiderians, to take everything in account relating to fossil evidence, anatomical remains, folklore, uh, you know, modern populations, what they look like, to see if we could create what one of the American giants, these Denisovan hybrids, might have actually looked like. And the answer is that. Um, now, that, I mean, I won't go into why, but you can see that the heavy brows, which obviously would be very similar to the Neanderthals and obviously the Homo heidelbergensis, very large skulls, uh, which seems to be uh, archaic, which is something which seems to come up again and again relating to the giants. Um, and, you know, high, high, high uh, cheekbones, various other things, which, which come up a lot. Okay? So, where else might these giants have got to? Well, the greatest amount of, of Denisovan DNA is in island Southeast Asia, up to 5%. Uh, and this is, this is the line that seems to, to, to mark it. Beyond that, in Eastern Asia, it's only about 1%. By the way, no Denisovan DNA has been found in European populations or even in Western Asian populations at this time. I mean, it could be found one day, but it's not there at the moment. But the greatest concentration is here. And it would seem as if the epicenter for Denisovan contact with modern humans was the area of eastern Anatolia, which was the former Sunderland landmass. Okay, in other words, in the past, up at the time of the, the last ice age, it was one huge landmass that was drowned when the ice melted and the waters, the sea waters, rose up again. And this is essentially the, the, the area that we are dealing with here. 
And I want you to focus on Java here, but just to be aware of Sulawesi up there. Because what's interesting is that on Java, it stated that the earliest inhabitants of the island were giants, um, known as the Rakshasa. And that's a Hindu term. But there are various stories to do with these giants um, on Java. And these are uh, statues that actually stand as guardians um, in the temples or the candy um, of Java. Okay? Now, in other words, are the, these Rakshasa, the, the giants of Java, are they Denisovans or Denisovan hybrids? I think almost certainly they are. But what we've also got in Java is a site which is coming up uh, big time now, and that's Gudun Badang. Uh, now, Gudun Badang is a series of megalithic stone settings um, on the top of a, um, what was considered to be a natural hill. But evidence coming out from a geological t team that's working there right now is suggesting that this is an artificial pyramid hill constructed over a natural volcanic um, um, you know, formation. And that this doesn't only date to the time of Gobekli Tepe, 9500 BC, but that there are deeper levels that go back to 22,000 BC. Now, as ridiculous as that might seem, what's interesting is that just within the last month or so, the evidence of the earliest rock art anywhere in the world has come from Sulawesi, the place I just showed you, which dates to a minimum of 39,000 years old. Images of animals, hands, um, things like this within caves. They've been known about for a while, but they've only just got the dating of this. Is it possible that these weren't created by human ancestors, but by Des Denisovans who inhabited this area, possibly giants, who, ex you know, who, who lived on Java and the Sunderland landmass in the past? And obviously interbred with that. Is it possible that just like the Neanderthals in the West, that the Denisovans affected the evolution of humanity in the East? I think the answer is almost certainly yes. Um, and what's beneath Gudun Padang? Well, apparently there is a chamber, and they're digging down to that chamber now as we speak. And I'm in touch with Danny Hillman, the geologist who's heading this team, and I will report back on what happens next time. So with that, I shall say thank you very much.